one needs the seas to be wetter We don't need all our cheese to be cheddar Our only needs to get better And better and better and better Hey everyone, I'm so excited to be here today with Vincent Todd Tolman, who is someone I briefly met at the Near Death Experience Conference. He was speaking there. He was sharing his book there. He kindly even gave me a copy and I read it and I what I said, oh, I really hope he will accept my invitation to come on this podcast and just share his story and uh, it's such and beautiful messages uh, that come along with that. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, awesome. I, I feel uh, very blessed to be a part of your your podcast group today and uh, super, super excited. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'll stop sharing and we'll mention the website at the end of the podcast again. And I'm not stop. Yeah, stop sharing my screen, obviously. <laughs> um. Okay, let's do that. And so then we could, uh, have, yeah, get into it. So yeah, please just share your story in your, your own words. It's so amazing. So um, back in January 18th of 2003, uh, me and my buddy, we were um, amateur bodybuilders and we took a supplement that we had ordered online and it turned out uh, it was not a good supplement. It was toxic. And uh, we, we both got really sick right away. So we, we decided, Hey, let's go get a bite to eat down at the local uh, burger joint and figured that would make us feel better. So we went down there and, um, we barely made it there. He, he stumbled in, collapsed on one of the booths and then started to vomit. And I went into the, the bathroom, which was a single use bathroom, locked the door and I collapsed and started to vomit. So we both collapsed and started to vomit. Just the problem was nobody saw me come into the bathroom. Um, everybody saw him come into the booth. So he, he, uh, you know, you know, they found him, called nine one one, got an ambulance there, and hauled him away. Meanwhile, uh, nobody knows I'm in the bathroom. So there, I did aspirate and I did die. Um, and from that point. I, I had the whole out of body experience. I saw them bag my body. I saw them, um, you know, pronounce me dead, put it in the body bag, put it in the back of a, an ambulance. And, and I didn't know it was me though. It took, I was a little slow <laughs> because me was up here watching things going on. And, um, so yeah, I watched them take that body and, and take it away and, uh, take it to the hospital or take it to the medical examiner and, and, and on the way, though, the medic, the, the rookie medic, he felt uh, God tell him that, that I wasn't all the way dead. So he he attempted resuscitation, was able to get the heart to come back after the second round of shocks or third round of shocks and um, and got the heart back. But the brain wasn't back. I was still brain dead for three days. So during those three days, I was I was off in heaven and and had the whole um, experience of, of traveling um essentially to heaven and wow. and then had the whole experience yeah i woke up from it after three days but but the experience itself was just like transformative and i was very uh i had a very clear cognizant experience i remember it vividly and um and i met a, a guide who who helped me through it all and at the time i didn't know my guide um later i found out who he was and it, it's a really cool experience, but it takes forever to tell you. But uh, but I'll tell you that I, I picked up some amazing principles, some amazing uh, divine eternal truths that are important for the world to understand. And it's not for everybody, but but man, people who read it and and really synchronize with it or or really connect to the truths there, they they love it. They really love it. So I'm I'm so grateful to be able to get the story out. We've been working on it for a long time and, and finally it's out. It's out. We, everybody can get it now. Yeah. 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 And I, I do think it is a story for everybody if they open the book with openness, because yeah. at the near death experience conference, I, I, I tried to pop into as many as I could. And it seemed like people had experiences that were tailored to them and what would mm -hmm. like what should be shown to them um, as they were out of their body. And I actually want to back up for a second, because I know you said the rookie was working on you and got this 
voice of God telling uh, yeah. this one's not gone yet, but who pronounced you dead? I really want people to understand, like, so, you were so, dead. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That, they, yeah. <laughs> when they found my body, um, they recorded on, on the DOA paperwork, um, on the dead on arrival paperwork, um, which is like the death certificate request, right? So on that, on that paperwork, it said my body temperature was 79 degrees. Um, so when they found me, it was 79 degrees. But by the time I was actually resuscitated, that was almost, uh, almost 45 minutes after they found me. So, so it was a good long process for them to, um, you know, bag the body, put it in the ambulance. They had to call a police officer, actually, wait for him to show up to sign paperwork. And then they could leave to go turn the body into the medical examiner. So, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a good long bit. And, and it was actually that there was three medics on the ambulance team that picked my body up. And there was two veteran medics who were sitting in the front and then one rookie. And it was literally his first week. And uh, it was the rookie who actually saved me, not, not the veterans, because the veterans, they, they showed up on site. They're like, no, dead guy. <laughs> cold stiff is you know i already had like rigor mortis starting to set in <laughs> and so, they were yeah, yelling at the rookie right don't do that what are you doing yeah so and and so what's funny is they did bog back the body nobody touched the body and then uh, they pull away from the scene and about a block and a half down the road um you know from where i am watching all this happen i actually felt like this this force like come over my shoulder my left shoulder and go past me and then i heard really really loud this one's not dead and um uh, and the, the rookie heard it too and he like looked around i saw him looking around but but right before he heard it though he started to glow he literally had this like glowing light around his heart area and um but he he kind of brushed it off as you know as my imagination or maybe it's one of the other medics trying to play a trick on him or something. Um, but then uh, only a few seconds later, it happened again. And right before it happened again, the second time, the light like went, went bolder and bigger. And it went above his, like right above his head down to about his waist. And, and it was, it was even louder the second time. And I heard this one's not dead, like so very loud and strong. And uh, the medic knew he's like, I got to act on that. So from that, he, he unzipped the body bag and started feeling around for a pulse and uh, couldn't feel a pulse. And he felt a little disgusted because the, the body was still covered with like vomit, you know, mm -hmm. I had aspirated. So he was feeling all over. It was cold. It was hard. It was actually hard and starting to go stiff and, you know, couldn't feel a pulse anywhere. He felt inside the arm, pit, didn't feel a pulse, then um, had to undo some straps on the, the gurney. And then unzip the body bag enough that he could get down to the inside of the, the leg, the thigh. And as he felt in and got to the thigh, he, he felt like this ignition. And it was, it was weird. It was like a spark. It mm. was um, like if you've ever um, messed around with car batteries or like you accidentally touched one with a, a cable, okay. it, like that, that spark, it's. That's what it felt like to me. I was silly enough as a kid to stick my finger in the socket. There so, you go. So something yeah. like that. Yeah. It felt like that. And when it was weird because he, it was not a pulse, but the fact that that happened to him, that was enough of a sign okay. that, Hey, I got to try. I got to try. Cause if that was some type of energy or pulse, he wanted to do something about it. So he did, he, he began the resuscitation process hooked up a um, uh, defibrillator on me and the first round, nothing. And until the, he hooked up the defib on me, the other two medics didn't know what was going on. Okay. As soon as he hooked that up, the defib alarm started to go off, like to clear your hands from the body. Okay. And, and as that alarm went off, the other two medics were like, what are you doing? You idiot. You're going to get fired. You can't do this. They're like going after him. They're like, dude, you're going to, you're going to get fired. You cannot do this. You can't do this to a dead body. So um, he kept doing it though. He went the first round, no, no heartbeat. The second round of shocks, there was one single heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And when that one single heartbeat happened, all of a sudden the other two medics like stopped. They're like, <gasps> they're like, what, how, what, you know, like that doesn't happen. 
And then the third round of shocks came and it was a very slow, but very faint, but very steady heartbeat. And it was steady, consistent. And, um, and truly it's a miracle. It is a miracle. When I woke up from this whole experience, um, uh, you know, as you learn when in my, in my book, when I first woke up, I actually didn't remember even being in heaven. I was completely blacked out essentially from right before I died until when I woke up in the hospital and I couldn't remember any of the stuff. And so I was, I was like amazed. Everyone's going around calling me the miracle boy, the miracle boy. I'm like, <laughs> you guys are crazy. I, I was fine just yesterday, even though that was actually three days earlier, you know, wow. like I was, yeah. I was a little confused in my head and, um, but yeah, it took, took the, uh, loving, loving, uh, uh, action of my sister. She, she kind of cornered me, took me to dinner and cornered me. And she's like, so, like, you know, you were dead. Right. And I'm like, yeah, everybody says I was dead. I guess I was dead. And, and she goes, well, uh, did you have an out of body experience? Did you see anything? And literally with my mouth, I went to, to form the words, no, but what came out of me was yes. I saw, I saw this, I, I started re- saying all these things I saw and it, it felt like, it felt like something else took over me. It really did. And then as, as I was saying it, um, it was like all of a sudden the, the blinds came up and I remembered my whole experience all at once. And I started, I started to cry. I got so emotional because everything there is such a high love frequency, everything there is. And to exist here, it's, it's, it's not a love frequency here. So, uh, you know, to even think about it or talk about it, I would just cry. And so it took me a couple of years to even be okay talking about it publicly. In fact, I would only really talk about it with my wife for the first couple of years. And then we'd share it here and there when, when friends needed help because they lost somebody or they knew what someone in their family was terminally ill, you know, they needed they needed to hear the experience maybe to help them. So yeah. for over the years, that's how we shared it for the first five years or so. But for about the last 10 years, I've been publicly sharing it with groups and church groups. And, and, and it's, it's really had a very positive effect for, for most people. Um, some, it's not the right story for everybody. And, and I've never ever professed that this is, this is a great revelation for the world. It's not that what it is though, is it's, it's an awesome experience I had, a very divine, sacred experience I had, and it really helps me connect to my creator. And if it can help you connect to your creator, awesome. And, and if you don't believe in a creator, it can help you connect to the universe, to yeah. the, the, great, the great loving force in, in the universe. Yeah. That's why it's worth when you said not for everyone, because not everyone, uh, I think um, you mentioned in your book, you were raised religious. And so when you went and... Uh, I don't even know where to say when, but connected to all that is and divine, or you might even call it heaven, right? Like someone else might call it something yeah. different. Yeah. But, and and um, I use, I use the, like the placement word of heaven, because that's what I was raised with, but really it's heaven. The word itself cannot describe this, this realm and, mm-hmm. and more, more easily it is described as a realm, but a multidimensional, like multi-frequency, multifaceted omnipresent on the energy realm yeah and you said just love frequency is that the way you worded it yes or how, how'd you word it love frequency love frequency yeah. yeah yeah oh did you get the little coin at the so this is what we put in people's bags which is basically like in the center yeah i love that um, yeah yeah so based that's the way i see the world now and even in myself like anytime something's not aligned with love if it feels icky or if I feel jealous or whatever it is I'm able to like with love and curiosity see like (laughs) how is this trying to protect me and like how can I call this back to love or um you know flip the flip the coin as it were so um I think you know that's a common experience for people that near-death experience and then yeah where what they experience is 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 always super profound um and it's always different different stories and they're they're all so cool and when i had someone who said she posts about this stuff and people like are so mad at her just say you know what like i'm always here when 
if you ever want to know more, like yeah. I'm always here because then what happens, like you're saying, you told the stories when people were in despair and you offered them hope. So it's yeah. easy to bash on someone when everything's fine in your life. It or is. You're, right. In, but you're what people don't realize is most, most times people have the hardest problems with this are victims, people that have been victimized by something and, and they don't want anything to pull them out of their victimhood. They don't. And so if this is something that possibly threatens their victim ability, like their ability to be a victim for eternities, because that's what they want, that's what they identify as, then that then yeah, this is not their story. And and those are the ones that come right out and say, this can't be true, blah, blah. And you know, and I flat out tell them, like, hey, this, you know, say what you want. It, I, I can't go and debate my experience. Oh, no, 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 I no. Can't. I get it. Yeah. And in fact, I've even gone under hypnosis to see if there was anything I forgot about the experience. And no, the, the clean experience comes through exactly how it happened to me. And, and you know, it's just like um, I was having a good conversation last night with a buddy of mine that um, he's been very, very profoundly affected by the book. And one of the principles in the book is understanding the the um, influence of technology how technology helps or hurts us and uh, one of the examples i gave him is hey you know would you ever go to a dump and just start picking stuff off off the ground and start eating it and he's like no and well how come when people go to youtube they do that when they go to twitter they do that when they go to netflix they do that they just go somewhere and just start consuming. They don't even do any type of looking into what they're going to about to consume. And yes, they are consuming. When we watch something, energetically, we are consuming it. But here's the weird thing. We're consuming it a more, a more effective than we consume food. Because we can see something and energetically, it can literally alter our state for an eternity. Wow. But think about that. If you drink some orange juice, right? You drink some orange juice. Is that going to alternate alternate your eternal state? No. Right? But that that Thailand uh, energy thing did. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it knocked over the dominoes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, so it's it's just funny. And 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 I have a buddy that that um, he's got a Ferrari, and and I was joking with him one time. I'm like, hey would you ever, uh, you know, siphon some gutter water and just put it in your Ferrari? And he's like, no, I would never do that. I'm like, well, you know, we do that as a people very commonly. We just randomly listen to things. We randomly watch things. We, and, and when they don't synchronize with our truth, when they don't raise our frequency, they are definitely lowering our frequency. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, you know, it's really important for us as beings to understand that whatever we do in the last 30 minutes of, of our day and the first 30 minutes of our day, whatever we do to begin our day and to wrap up our day, that is our religion. Wow. That's. So think about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is, so they call this the hour of power, the 30 to 60 minutes before bed, the 30 to 60 minutes after you wake up. That is your hour of power. So like a scientist, look at yourself yeah, as an object. And, and what are you diving into right when you wake up? What are you diving into right before you go to bed? That is what your religion is. I don't care what symbol you wear around your neck or what church or synagogue or, or temple you go to. Because what you're doing in that hour of power, that is your religion. And what's, what I like to do is I like to teach people through my experience that you have the opportunity to, to choose what goes in your hour of power. And if you want that to be God, God can be there. And God can be a very present, everyday part of your life if you want God there. And I don't mean the go kneel down in a chapel, traditional sense of God. I mean the real version of God, the creator. And, and the creator is everywhere. And we have the ability, if we want to, to connect with the creator every single day. 
And, and that's, that's really what my experience is out there. And I, I call it um, the light after death because I literally had to die to learn how to live, which is a horrible thing to think. But I was, I was raised in a society that was so third world. It was so third dimensional. And I call it third world, but like 3D, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so third dimensional that, that I, was, I was abandoning God with my hour of power. And this is, this is you know, back in 2003 long before, you know, the Twitter and Facebook that we have today and, and all the me- social media we have today. But I'll tell you, like, we all have our hour of power. And that's a precious, precious time and space. And we can set ourselves up for um, a, a tremendous connection with the universe, with our creator, with the power, the, the real power of the universe, which is love. And if we do that, we will fundamentally change our entire existence, our eternal existence. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll go from being the victim of life to being victorious in life. Mm-hmm. And, and we, will, we will bring about and attract the right things to happen to us. Yeah. So, so that's what it's all about. And, and I'm not a, a, a push religion guy. I may push um, connect with the divine guy yeah yeah I, in, I, I, in whatever I, frame of religion you yeah. already carry connect with the divine yeah yeah the way i see it is um you know historically people had very spiritual experiences some of those got documented into religions people follow the religion like you're saying maybe they go kneel do this do that but the spiritual yeah. experience is the knowing the religion maybe you're t- you're following religion because you want to f- experience that knowing so i i always like separate the definition of uh, you know, spiritualism or whatever you want to call it, spirit and religion or spiritual experience and religion. Because you could choose whatever religion you want. You could also have a spiritual experience without a religion. So um, yeah, that's the way the way I look at it. And I think, um, you know, once people, because people get uh, all, you know, my religion, feather, your religion or whatever it is, or I don't want any yeah. religion, but we're, that's all we're, yeah, I like that you said, like, that's, that's not what you're talking about. Um, like you're talking about really that knowing. And I, I, I noticed too, every time you talk about the experience when you died, you're just like the body, the body. And I was just like, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not even my body anymore. It's mm-hmm. like the body. I feel like I didn't even know whose body that was. There was some guy well, there. It's, it's, it's weird. It's weird. I have a hard time calling it my body because it wasn't my body because my body was up here like watching everything, right? Yeah. So I was watching the body down there. Yeah. And, and that's kind of why I didn't know it was me right at first either. In fact, I didn't even know it was me all the way until they revived it and they were strapping the body down. Cause you know, a body has been dead for at least an hour. It was possibly up to two and a half hours total death um, time, but you know, a body has been dead that long and you bring it back. It has a hard time with that. So the body was actually going into seizures and, and, there's foam coming out of the mouth. Like there was some funky stuff going on with the body. And as that was happening, they had to strap it down to work on it at the hospital. And that's when I actually felt that it was my body because as they strapped the arms down, I actually felt my arms getting strapped. Oh, wow. So where, where I was, you know, watching all this, I felt my arms getting strapped. And I'm like, I'm like, what the heck? What, how is this happening? And I, I pushed, I pulled against the restriction, right? And I watched the body break one of the straps. Wow. And that's when I was, it hit me, like, it literally hit me like, an, uh, like the meanest, <laughs> the meanest um, words. You idiot. <laughs> this has been you the whole time. And how could you not know that you're dead? And I actually felt so bad. I felt like I was... I was so dumb. I was so, so ignorant for not knowing that I was dead, but I also felt bad about everything bad I'd ever done in my life. And then I, I must not be worth saving because here I was, I was only 25 when I died. So, you know, not a lot of experience at that time, but in those 25 years, I'd done a lot of stupid things, but at the same time, um, as I was feeling all of that, I started to feel all of the good things I did too. Cause I did some really good stuff too. Um, in fact, 
back then I worked for a really good TV show. I, I, um, you know, helped produce that, helped produce a, a pretty good movie. And, and I did that, but that was not even my good works. My good works was what I was able to do with friends and with family and with service. I went and served like a two year mission. Um, I did all of that. And, and so I got to see that that was pretty good and that, that helped you surf a lot of the bad. But what I felt, what was so amazing to me is as this, this fear and this, like this self judgment of being an idiot for not knowing I was dead, as that was starting to collapse on me, I felt this warmth come from behind me and this warmth, it's, it's so hard to put into words because it, it was true love. And it's not something we ever get to feel here. This version of love does not exist here. It doesn't. I wish it did. Um, the closest thing that you can get here is the love that a parent has for a baby or, you know, your newborn child, that kind of thing. But this love I felt, it, it was just so strong and powerful. It, it, it encompassed me. It, it flushed out all that darkness and fear mm -hmm. that I was feeling. And as it flushed out of me, I realized that, that I didn't need to worry about whether I deserved that love or not, that it was there for me no matter what. And, and if there's anything I can get as a message for, for anybody, for, like a takeaway from my experience is God, our creator, the universe, loves every single one of us exactly how we are right now. Like God doesn't love us for who he wants us to be. You know, the creator doesn't love us for who the creator wants us to become. The creator loves us for who we are exactly as we sit right now. And that's pretty profound because a lot of religions don't teach that. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Now you're reminding me too. like, um, you know, I heard someone else say the biggest thing people have a, a challenge with in her experience, she said, like, there's only one place, if you will, like, there's no heaven or hell, like there's no bad place, in other words, and a lot of people have a hard time with that. Um, but you know, that the people, your experience, everyone's experience, right? You're sharing your experience, yeah. not doing it to try to make people well, there is, and, and that's the thing, there is a hell. And and it's here. This is hell. <laughs> yeah, like okay. we, we are, we're essentially living in hell here. And, and even here, right, we can get inside of our own head and create even more of a hell, right? Mm -hmm. Like in our own mind with anxieties and worries and, and self-judgment and self-worth issues, like we can create our own hell right here, right? So it's the same there. So when we, when we cross and, and we're on our journey, we can essentially put ourselves in a hell of sorts there but it's self-created. It's not created by God or the creator. It's self-created. We create it in our holy temple, you know, in our temples right here. That's where the hell is created. And that's the only real hell that exists is it's created by us. And what, what's super amazing about it is God knows that some of us have that issue. So God created these special places. They show up in my experience like these pearls these orbs, these orbs are where we go when we have these, these hells that we're in, where we can cleanse ourselves of that, where we can work out whatever negative energy is there, whether it's like victimhood, self-judgment, um, the inability to forgive someone, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. We help, some people call it our, our karma, right? We can, we can cleanse ourselves or distress or de decompress ourselves from that. Mm -hmm. And then the second that we release it and we fully release it, we embrace the, that, that light or that love frequency, all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. There's all of these powers that come forward to help you move forward. And it comes from all over. And it's so, so amazing. Like the amount of power and love that's there. People have no idea. Like there is entire teams of loving individuals working with every single one of us every single day. And the second that we need their, their help and we actually embrace their help, boom, they're there. They're there to help us. But we got to, we got to call on them though, too. Yes. We got to ask. We got to ask. Yeah. yeah. 
And it's just like with the, you know, putting ourselves in that um, existential hell in our own mind until we actually choose to release that, until we actually choose to embrace what's next. We have to ask, we have to, it's all in the intention, you know, yes. the, the power, the power of choice and agency. And that's, and that's a, a big takeaway from the book too, is that's why we're here is we're here to learn the power of agency, to learn how to make choices. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. And I found that even in my experience that the intention matters as well as like a will, but I don't mean like an egoic will, but I mean like yeah. a, a soulful, strong will. Um, yeah, this, that's, that's so cool. Now, was there something that I, I know you, you tell everything in, in your book, so I don't want to ask you to spoil stuff. I, you might even be, no, whatever. I, I, I don't know. Could you, is there a story you're comfortable sharing? Um, like one of your adventures or, or anything sure. that we can know at this point? Well, my, my, my guide, I met, his name was Drake. He introduced himself. Um, I thought he must be God. And he said, no, I'm not God. And uh, he kind of looked like the old Hollywood version of what in movies they portrayed God to look like, you know, this white guy with a long white beard and pink skin, kind of like almost a Santa Claus ish type, but, yeah. but not. And, um, <laughs> And so I thought, you know, hey, he must be God. And he's like, no, I'm not God. He's, he's like laughing about it. And and so I'm like, well, are, he doesn't look like Jesus, but are you Jesus? <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm not Jesus. And I, I was like, well, who are you? And he said, he just explained. He said, well, my name is Drake. You can call me Drake. And I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you go where you want to go. You can come with me and I can show you what's next for you, you know, or I can take you back to where you just came from in your body. And even the thought of going back to my body, like made me ache. Like, I'm like, no, I want to go with you because whatever that body crap that is, that's going on there. I don't want that. That looks like m- worse than hell, you know? And so, um, so we, we began on the journey and we, we learned though, well, I learned he was teaching me is that, even being a really good religious kid growing up. And I knew, I actually knew quite a bit about a lot of religions. I had studied extensively Buddhism for two years. I did, I had studied Catholicism. Um, I had studied uh, uh, the baptistry or, or, you know, being Baptist and uh, Pentecostal and Methodist. And so I'd studied quite a few religions in, including a little Hare Krishna and Hinduism. But I didn't know what I needed to know. And that amazed me. I, I thought, you know, but I, I studied so much specifically in Christianity. I thought for sure I knew everything. that I'd been baptized or christened. You know, I'd, I'd been through the whole process. I'm, I'm on the fast track, right? And he's like, nope. He said, he, you know, lovingly, he showed me that, that I had a lot to learn. So for me, he, I had to go over 10 primary principles and, and he didn't lay it out like that. It just so happens that we went through 10 very specific principles for me to get to heaven. And, um, and that was really hard. That was actually, that was very expansive on my, on my consciousness, on my brain, you know, what, what we would consider our brain or our, our mind, my consciousness, that was very hard on it. Because it was so many things that I, I had to really dive deep into who I was to, and, and peel away a lot of fallacies and falseness for me to be authentically who I was and, and get to heaven. But it was really neat, though, once I, I actually got there, um, I got to actually see heaven and touch down and actually see the grass and see this amazing building, just the most beautiful building. Um, and this is really hard to describe, but this building there, it's, it's like a Capitol building, right? Like that you see at a lot of our capitals, but way more beautiful and glorious. And the entire building was built out of one piece of marble and the marble like formed what it was lovingly asked to form. And the, the, the building itself had a presence or a consciousness in it 
a, it had love emitting from it. Um, even the grass there had consciousness and had love. And, and what's so cool is the grass itself had light coming off of it. It smelled so amazing. And you could actually taste it just by being near it. And, and you could actually feel, you could feel the love of our creator by just experiencing just the grass, just the grass. And I got to see flowers and trees and this river and like this lake thing. And I like, there's not words to describe because our words can't describe it. It's, it's an experience outside the physical body. And the physical body is so tiny compared to our real existence. I mean, we're who we really are in spirit and soul we're so much bigger than our physical bodies. We are, we're so much bigger. And so for us to be here in these physical bodies, it's very limiting. And, you know, it's like jamming, it's like jamming a, um, a cruise ship into a, a pen. You know, it's <laughs> like, we're way, we're, we're way bigger than the pen and we're just jammed all in there. That's yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you, it was a, absolutely beautifully profound experience where I got to to really see who the creator is and and through my guide I got to feel the power of our creator and realize that the creator is not just a man or a woman um, or a force it's bigger the creator is bigger than than what we can um, identify as just a, a single being that that force, that love is so vast and huge and so just amazing. And, and that was, you know, again, another principle that was hard for me was understanding what our, who our creator really is. is so much bigger and vast than we can ever understand. But so is life. Life is, life is so much bigger and more beautiful than we can ever understand. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you are here now, um, do you have similar experiences maybe in nature or somewhere else where you, you, you feel that love? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, there's a, it's weird since I died and came back, sometimes it will be a show that's on. And when there's something really endearing done, I feel the love of that endearment and it really connects to who I am and it connects to my experience when I see little children do endearing things for each other, like selfless caring things. Yeah. When I see other adults doing that selfless caring things, it like melts me. It does. <laughs> I tend I, to, yeah. I wasn't ever a crier before my experience. So I unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but I do uh, tend to tear up a bit when there's real divine love going on around me. When, especially when it's one being to another, because that is how we, serve our our god serve our creator is by serving each other and and understanding that when we do serve each other we're serving god when we are but what also when we're not forgiving others we're not forgiving god mm -hmm. and when we're hating others we're hating god so um that that's that a, a two-way was that's that one a of two the hard ones street. one of the hard oh, ones yeah. for you? well especially for me I, I i i had a pretty abusive upbringing and um and so I had a lot of um, unforgiveness. And um, one of the things I had to understand was, you know, not forgiving someone is like carrying, you know, carrying a bottle of poison and saying, I'm going to drink this and hope you die. You know, or I hope I'm going to drink this deadly poison and hope you get sick. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. And when we, when we point our, our, our finger of anger towards someone else, all we're doing, whether, whether it's anger or unforgiveness, when we're pointing that to, to them, we're pointing one thumb up to God, and then we're pointing the other three fingers back to us. Oh, wow. So, so whenever we're outwardly expressing good or bad, Mm. we're compounding it three times back towards ourselves. Oh, wow. And you've, have you've heard, I've heard that just in, I guess, 
fiction or books that like it comes back to you threefold when you do something and bad and you know like these little truths in the stories that we hear um <laughs> yeah. and one of my buddies one of my buddies is like okay from now on i'm gonna go like this when i point at people <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like it doesn't matter it's, it's still, not gonna help it's you. still the same principle <laughs> when you blame them you blame god and you blame yourself three times yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, I have so many questions. Um, I know we're, we have some, not, not too much time. Uh, like, I, I guess I would love your take on, do you make a distinction between spirit and soul? Like I have a spirit and I have a soul or, or do you find that that or is just words and it's two words of, for the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Two words for the okay. same thing. And, okay. and really, if you, if you understand the dynamics of, who our soul is, who, who we are as beings, is we, we have a higher soul, which is our anchoring in the universe. Mm. And, where, and where we exist here is an aspect of that soul, right? So, so when, we, when we have a conscience, like a conscience, that's a connection or a message from the higher self, the higher soul, right? But it's still just our soul, our spirit, same thing. But we the way that God set up this existence so that we could learn in all the ways that we want to, um, that soul can be in a lot of different places. And, and it's really a beautiful thing. Now it, we're not going to be necessarily in a lot of different places in this timeline or this frequency or this universe. Right. But we, the, the soul itself is just so vast. And so it, it's so beautiful and amazing. And what, I think is amazing about my experience is we can all connect to our, our own inner divinity because mm. that higher self, that higher soul of ourselves, it's so close to God and our creator that it is, it is essentially our creator. It's, it is who our creator is. So if we want to connect, we can connect. We have an inside route. Nice. It's like we have an, you know, we don't have to go to the world wide web. We go to the internal web. I, I read this one day. I don't know if you could see it. It says, be your own natural divinity. Oh, yeah. I love the way that. we talk about like beyond. Yeah, I love like, that. It's nowhere. Um, it's here or and or, and or whatever, is. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess my, my thing that I still like wonder about, because I know I'll hear stories and, and from someone who had a near-death experience and say oh i still had my witty personality um you had some like um oh no i'm an idiot um when i was choking and almost died i heard like this voice saying um you're such an idiot we were raised that way are you an idiot are you a yeah. big idiot you know and so it was like this thought i guess that was mine but it didn't feel like mine it felt away um but then also and you know you hear stories of people say uh, they take on the form that they like. So it, even if someone dies at old age or, or you know, they looked sick when they died, they they take on the, the younger look. Um, they do, like, yeah. What I'm getting at is like, like a, if we had um, a brain injury and like people who are like truly kind naturally and they get a brain injury, they could be like really nasty or a different personality or things like that. Mm -hmm. And so how does that, how do you make, cause I, that's how I have a lot of forgiveness is because I consider the body like a biological spacesuit. And if let's yep. say, you know, things are misfiring or the body has adapted for uh, fear and protection versus safety and connection, like all that victim stuff is probably like a defense mechanism of, of the ner nervous system being like, we're dangerous world, dangerous world, dangerous world. Yeah. Um, and then well, what, what, what it yeah, is, what's, is our, what's, so that's what's the right. Yeah. So what, what it is to explain it is the soul, the way that it anchors into the physical vessel hmm. is the divine relationship starts with the soul itself coming into the physical vessel. Um, at the bottom of the, the anchoring of the physical vessel, there's the ego, right? And the ego is an, a distinct voice. And that's hmm. the mean voice. That's the I'm going to yell at you voice. That's the idiot voice. That's the judgmental voice. That's also the cautious voice, like, you yeah. better not do that. You're going to get hurt. Um, that's, that's, that's there to protect uh, and preserve the physical life of the body, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and, and that ego voice also is an acronym for edging God out. 
Oh, because it's a it's a tug of war. Because the soul is the the high aspect of yeah. the existence. The ego is the lowest aspect of the is- existence. It's the low third dimension, right? And what's crazy is who's the referee? The mind. Okay. So the mind gets to choose. You know, who am I going to be friends with? Who am I going to listen to? And for some of us, we get at a brain injury, and now all we can listen to is ego. Oh. So that's that's the only thing that comes out. Now, is there still a higher soul there? Absolutely. Yeah. But because of the brain injury, the mind can't can't be the referee anymore. It's it's chosen one side. I love that yeah. way of looking at it because I that's how I have I have forgiven this for everything. Um, my daughter makes fun of me. She's like, you you even like narcissist. Not that I'm like gonna marry a narcissist or something like that, but like I have like such even like um compassion for someone who has like that kind of stuff going on. And it's because I think exactly I couldn't put words to it, but that's like the perfect way of looking at it because yeah, this is still a perfect soul. Yep. Um, but listening to that, I heard another cool one. Um, uh, Dr. Wade Dyer said earth guide only for ego. Yeah. Earth guide only. Yeah. Earth guide it's only. Just, it's just for out. your, it's, yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's cool, just for right? your, it's for your yeah. earth life. Yeah. 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 It's, so then, and- then it's personality funny though, when I, and all that, when we, how yeah. does that factor? How does well, that the factor? Pers- in- the personality is essentially the imprint mm. or the effect of having the existence here in combination with the, the, the personality that was already there before we began here. Okay. Right. So just like you, you can go to college and you might, you know, say a guy goes to college, a girl, a mustache or start growing a beard, start working out. Like it doesn't change us completely who we are, but it, it changes attributes of who we are. Right. So our higher soul was, is our higher soul before we got here. Then when we come here, we'll take on some of the attributes. Like for instance, when I would see spirits or see other souls on the other side, if I could not pick out a distinct sex like I couldn't tell if they're male or female. That was an easy way for me to know, oh, they've never been to earth before. Oh, wow. But if I could pick out a distinct, oh yeah, that looks like a woman, that looks like a man, or, you know, they, you know, divine feminine, divine masculine. If I could pick out one or the other, I'm like, oh yeah, they've been to earth. They've been to earth. They've been to earth. But that would also um, give a lot of answers to people that, you know, are having such a hard time now with, their sexuality is because sexuality is just a third dimensional thing. It is. Okay. I don't care what people want to believe the, 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 the energetics that we get to be involved with in the spirit realm are so much better than, than the, the best sexuality you can experience here. Just, I mean, it really is. It's such so much more beautiful and, and amazing that we get to experience there. We don't need sex. It's not, it's not, I mean, it's, it's truly a symptom of the third dimension and only the third dimension. Cause why, you know, why is it that there's sex for, for, you know, uh, for procreation, which there in the spirit realm, if you want to create, you just create. Okay. So do do, do new spirits get created? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. So but, in other words, but, well, there's no sex because it's basically like we're beings of light. We are or, beings of light, and right. but it's not it's not um, it's not to say there's no loving, intimate embrace because that's you get to have that in such a beautiful way there that that's way better than you can ever experience here, and way better than the sex is, that you can experience here. But I'll tell you, like the. Um, like sex is just a, a condition of the third dimension. That's it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It's not, it's not needed. I mean, especially if you're not in, once you, you peel away from this physical body, your energetic body is so much more vast and grander than this little physical body. You don't need to go bump a couple, you know, energetic bodies to make other energetic bodies. This doesn't work that way. All you do is channel energy and you can create whatever you want to create. Yeah. That's so cool. Super cool. Wow. Yeah. I, that, I love that. Cause I, I think about those things um, or you think about people who have multiple personality disorder or, or 
um, you know, change the the classic Phineas Gage, you know, the thing through his head. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, um, what do we take with us? Well, like you're saying, there's something beforehand projected through this body. Um, and then that, I like that tug of war. Um, it really paints a nice picture. Yeah. Nice. nice. Oh, wow. So I can't believe it. Like I've already been talking to you for an hour. It feels like nothing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, so I won't go down any more uh, question rabbit holes. Is there any other things that you'd like to share before we like let everyone know where to find you? Also, if you have anything um, well, coming if, up that you want to share. If there's any takeaway that I could give you from my whole experience is to understand that there is a, a truly um, very powerful divine love for you, the individual. And uh, if you will open yourself up to that divine connection, turn, a, turn away so much from your technology or use your technology to help you find that inner connection, um, it's worth it. It's really, really worth it. Because one of the reasons why we're so unhappy in today's society is because we, we've turned away from that inner divinity. And it's not who we are. We're not third dimensional beings. We're not. We know we're not. Even even physicists will tell you we're not. Yeah. We are we are energetic beings, all of us, and um, it's very important for us to understand that. And once we, if we can open up and understand how much we are really loved, and and look into that, open up to the universe, to, to our Creator, you can really change your life. Yeah. 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 Amazing. So. Um, I could pull up the the website again on a on a screen. Yeah. Share. So, so yeah, my uh, the book website itself. You can find me on Amazon, um, or the name of the book is thelightafterdeath.com. You can buy it there too. So uh, Amazon or thelightafterdeath.com. Now, um, I also have my own personal website called Living God's Light, and um, Living God's Light is a community of people that we're building and we're building a workbook around this book actually with through that community. And it's, it's uh, helping people connect to their inner divinity and, and really walk in the light of God and, and live in that light. And that's why it's called living God's light. Yeah. So living God's light.com is, oh, yeah. is my personal website. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oops. Am I scrolling the wrong thing? Yes. No, that's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That looks great. And they could uh, hear other interviews as well. On yes. And all kinds of things. Amazing. Well, I'm sure I will see you uh, at the next near death experience conference and get to next yes. and hear your, you speak uh, again. And, um, but please, you know, if you have anything is news, um, I'm happy to share it. Uh, if you ever want to chat again, I am really so appreciative that you said Absolutely. yes. Absolutely, yeah. And if um, you have uh, if you have a lot of people that watch this and you're and you're following and have questions, they can um, send those questions to you. And hey, let's do another one of these and answer those questions. That'd yeah. be fun. Yeah, yeah. And if I think of any, maybe I'll send you if I after I get off this and say, oh, I, I wanted to ask that. You know, I'll try to maybe keep a little list, but um, been super super helpful and. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, like I tell everybody, this message isn't for everybody. But, you know, give it a whirl. If you if it really connects to you, embrace it. It You know, there's that divine light within you. And uh, all you have to do is just do a little knocking, a little knocking on the heart to let it come out. Love that. You have a great yeah. way with words. The power hour. I mean, sometimes we end these podcasts with a challenge and I, I know it didn't, or like an invitation to do something. And so hey, let's do that. Let's do the, I'm going to invite everybody to be cognizant and conscience or conscious of your hour of power. Yeah. So, so look at what you're reaching for right when you wake up, that's who you're worshiping, whatever it is, whether it's sports, whether it's news, whether it's entertainment, whether it's work, that's who you're worshiping. So be very present and cognizant with that, that time. And then the, the half hour or hour before you go to bed, same thing. 
but you know, you get, we're the builders of our own universe. So um, we're the creators of our own reality. If we want, we can change that. All we have to do is say, okay, I'm going to choose what goes in my hour of power. And if that means, you know, going on walks or doing a, a quiet meditation or sitting with nature or just drinking water, like you can, you get to be the one in control, not, not uh, your ego. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, so cool. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to do it. You, you know, I, I've been having uh, this excuse of, I love lucid dreaming and there's a wake back to bed technique and you're better off um, doing a lucid dream, like after your first round of sleep anyway. And I don't oh, yeah. need an alarm to wake me up to go back to bed because of my, <laughs> my biological spacesuit needs to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night anyway. So I've been making an excuse of like falling asleep, watching shows, nothing evil or uh, murdery, yeah. um, but still maybe not the best choice um, and to fall asleep to. And I know, you know, part of me is like, it's probably not a good idea, Jess. Another part of me is like, no, I'm just going to doze off to this. And then later I'll do the lucid dreaming, you know, or something else. But my morning is good. Um, but this definitely, I'm taking this invitation personally and uh, going to mix well, things up. Well, what's cool is I've, I've had people say, hey, you know what? I use my hour of power to, to watch motivational YouTubes. Yeah. Or, or they use their hour of power to listen to frequency sounds. Because mm -hmm. there is, you know, every part of our body has a frequency. And if you want to look that up, there's a lot of different information on there. And so someone says, you know what? I want to listen to my heart frequency. And so mm -hmm. they'll listen to that when they go to bed. They'll listen to it when they wake up for 30 minutes. And it just helps them be more heart centered. Yeah. And but it puts them in the control of their life. Yeah. Instead of instead of being in the back seat of the car, get in the front seat and start driving, you know. It's, yeah, it's, it's so important. And, and with just leaving media on, I used to be one like that, that would just, I would throw it on my favorite channel, which was usually had law and order all the time. Oh, dun, dun, <laughs> and, dun, dun, yeah. Dun. And you know what, I, I, um, uh, I started realizing, wow, I'm really, um, you know, not honoring my hour of power, like law and order was becoming my religion, because it was what I was, you know, watching for 30 minutes or whatever, before I went to bed. And I realized, you know, that's a sacred time. And so first things first, I got the TV out of the bedroom. Best thing I ever did. Um, second thing, second, get an alarm clock. Don't use your phone. Like get okay. an alarm clock. Go plug your phone in, in a room away if you can. Like if you can do this, this is one of the hardest things for people to do. But if you can do that, that alone changes you. Yeah. The fact, the fact that you can untether yourself and it seems so simple and stupid, right? But if you can be okay charging your phone in the other room while you sleep, that that alone will change people right there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll really let you go this time. Thank you so much. Okay. Again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica. Yeah, so so nice to talk to you today. And uh, and yeah, so nice to so much nice to meet you at the conference yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. And okay. I will I will see you at the next one for sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Take good care. <laughs> All Bye. right, you too. Bye bye. This is Falkley. Sunlight streaming, I'm better. Shun.